I'm Alex Bell, and this is To The Point, a show that dives deep into issues that impact communities across Northern California. And tonight's main point, California has a real problem on its hands when it comes to housing, from availability and affordability to homelessness. Economists say that we need more housing. There's no simple solution, but two Northern California companies are trying to shake things up in the construction industry. Instead of conventional stick-built homes, they're using a 3D printer, something that they think will make a big difference in the years to come. This is the sound of progress. This is our batch plant and mixer. And these are two people bringing that progress to Northern California. I'm the founder and chief visionary officer. Matthew Guile and Donna Jamian. And I am the CEO. Lead Emergent 3D, a company based in Redding, where Guile's family moved four years ago. We moved here two weeks before the car fire. On the list of California's top 20 largest wildfires, the car fire burned nearly 230,000 acres across Shasta and Trinity counties in 2018, destroying hundreds of homes and killing eight people. As wildfires threaten lives and homes amid California's housing shortage, 3D printing is an evolving technology that could make a difference. Why? Because Emergent 3D says their process of printing on site using concrete is faster and less expensive than conventional construction. Today, if the average home is taking eight months to build just because of supply chain issues, perhaps we can get this 3D printed one done in about six uh, months or so. Using this all-electric 3D construction printer from the Danish company Kobod, Emergent 3D plans on producing what they call the Wildfire Restoration House, a 1,200-square-foot, three-bedroom, two-bathroom home that meets all of California's requirements for building in wildfire-prone areas. To so try to get our disaster recovery families rebuilt quickly and in more fire resilient homes. They'll be printing houses in paradise this fall where the 2018 campfire destroyed thousands of homes and killed 85 people. For families that are moving in that maybe have been traumatized as a result of having to flee for their lives and have their homes burned down, to have a concrete home can give you some peace of mind. Over in Oakland, a company called Mighty Buildings is focused on two crises, housing and the environment. Check out these finished exterior walls, all 3D printed right here at Mighty Buildings facility in Oakland. You can see the printed resin-based layers made up of 60% recycled material. Their goal is to be as sustainable as possible as they partner with developers to 3D print entire neighborhoods. Our homes are modern looking, they're bright, they're focused on energy consumption. Chief Operating Officer Russ Atassi says Mighty Buildings is working with developers in California now and has plans to build in other states and countries too, addressing a housing shortage that goes beyond our state lines. We're 75 percent faster end-to-end -end deploying homes versus traditional home construction. But 3D printing alone won't solve California's housing crisis, so we wanted to find out what's preventing developers and construction companies from building more traditional homes like these to meet the demand. Hi, I'm Christopher Brown. I'm the uh, president of Next New Homes Group. We're ingrained in every part of the Sacramento real estate market. Normal front door of the house is down in this way. We met up with Christopher Brown in Roseville, where his company is building 11 higher-end homes as part of a larger development. You know, we went through an exorbitant increase in demand during COVID. Unprecedented. We as home builders normally go, oh great, we're going to build more homes this year. Well, we didn't have materials and we didn't have any labor. The price of lumber alone, that's over 60% higher than the 25 year average. That goes into the price of the house. Plus, he says the permitting process can take years and those fees drive up costs too. The North State Building Industry Association estimates an average of about $95,000 in fees per house in the Sacramento region and 55,000 throughout other parts of the Central Valley. Every time we raise prices and we're building a home for $500,000, people have to understand what went into that is probably about $490,000 worth of cost. There's that little bit left over. If you understand that, you know, that helps to understand how do we fix things in California. Could 3D printing make a difference here? Even though everything we do is very risky because the market ups and downs, but we're a very risk averse business. Partly because we know how to build things and we know what works. We would love to bring more new things like 3D printing and those kind of things, but if we brought, brought that to a community here in Sacramento, we now have to educate all the building officials, all the planning officials, because it's different. Something these NorCal companies know all too well. We're working with jurisdictions, regulatory agencies. There's definitely an educational process because these are different than your stick build operation. You then give to the inspectors. Emergent 3D is excited to have approvals from four local governments for its wildfire restoration House. After the city of Reading, we got it approved in Shasta County, in 
Butte County and in the town of Paradise. So remember these names as 3D printing technology evolves and these companies continue to grow, Emergent 3D plans on printing their homes to help more than just wildfire survivors. We really want to help address workforce housing, affordable housing, disaster recovery, and homelessness recovery housing. And Mighty Buildings plans on printing entire sustainable neighborhoods with hundreds of homes each. I think we're just scratching the surface where this can go. Adding to the housing stock and chipping away at the housing crisis one layer at a time. You know that wildfire restoration house can be printed in 31 and a half hours. But the reason it takes about six to eight months to deliver is because there are still so many conventional construction components in these homes, like electricity, heating, plumbing, roofing, things like that. But printing the walls definitely makes a difference in the time. And you know, you hear 3D printing, but like to see the visuals, it's like, oh my goodness, it's pretty amazing. It's mm -hmm. amazing. But what about the price of these homes? Are they affordable? What are we looking at? It depends on the company, right? Uh, Emergent 3D, the Reading folks, they say that people can save about 11% on a home of the, you know, the same size, conventionally built, um, but they anticipate that savings increasing as the technology improves up to 20%, they say. Now, Mighty Buildings in Oakland says their costs are about on par with a house of the same size, but they anticipate people uh, saving a lot on heating and cooling because of how sustainably built their homes are. And some people hearing this, they might be wondering, is 3D printing going to be taking away from construction jobs? Because now you have a machine doing what normally a person would be doing. Yep, that is a great question. You know, I asked Emergent 3D that, and they said that they're seeing more people leave the construction industry than come in. And so uh, the technology of 3D printing could help them leverage an already depleted workforce. But of course, I wanted to check in with a more neutral third party, right? So I reached out to the UC Berkeley Labor Center to ask those same questions. They said that First of all, it's too early to tell. The technology is still too new. There haven't been a lot of studies done at this point. But they also said that technology can replace tasks, not necessarily jobs, and that it could ultimately make the construction workforce more productive. So again, we will see as this evolves. And a, a quick question before we go here. What about insurance? Will people who buy these homes be able to insure them? That is an important question. We know homes built in the wildfire areas, the prone areas are uh, hard to insure. Emergent 3D says they have connected with an insurance company who has said, yep, you check the boxes and all the wildfire resistant needs, uh, we will insure you. So that is very important. And I also want to mention, Becca is our lead reporter here on To The Point. So you're going to be seeing a lot more of her. We cannot wait to share what she's been working on. But really quickly here, Becca, if people want to reach you, how can they do that? Yeah, if you have a story that you think needs diving deeper into, I'd love to hear from you. Reach out to me on Facebook or on Twitter. My handle is Becca, B-E-C-C-A, reports. All right, Becca, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, Alex. And thousands of Kaiser Permanente mental health care workers are on strike. We're going to get into what they're demanding and why there is a bigger issue across the state. Thousands of Kaiser Permanente mental health care workers are now on strike in Northern California and the Central Valley. Negotiations between the National Union of Health Workers and Kaiser fell through on Saturday. Psychologists, social workers, family therapists, and chemical dependency counselors are all impacted by this. And one of the union's claims is that there is a shortage of staffing and long wait times for patients. They say Kaiser did not have a plan in place to comply with State Senate Bill 221. It's a new law designed to make sure that mental health care patients get treated in a timely manner. Now, the law requires insurers to schedule follow-up appointments within 10 days of recommended by a therapist. One patient that we heard from today said that he waited weeks to meet with someone. Almost two months, yes. And that's after I was actually settled with the therapist. I was told that I would have seven to uh, uh, seven or eight weeks between each appointment. Did they give you a reason why the length of time is so They said that's just what Kaiser does. This is what we offer, take it or leave it. The state is currently working into whether the company is providing adequate mental health care for its members. Meanwhile, Kaiser says that the implementation of SB 221 to their services is well underway and that they are meeting regularly with the state for guidance. Now, Kaiser adds, quote, despite a national mental health workforce crisis in the midst of a global pandemic, we added nearly 200 net new clinicians in California between January 2021 and June 2022. And let's look at the bigger picture. The demand for mental health services went up significantly during the pandemic. One local mental health policy advocate tells us that California is facing a workforce crisis. Today, only one third of people living with a mental illness receive the care that they need. 31 counties with a high need for services also report a workforce shortage. 
Places like Placer County are creating more ways to offer care, and we got an inside look at the Lotus Behavioral Health Crisis Center out in Roseville today. It's a new voluntary urgent care center for those experiencing a mental health crisis. It will be ready in early September. And there is a lot to unpack about the mental health crisis right here in our state. We will be taking a deeper look at the Kaiser strike and mental health care professional shortages coming up later on To The Point this week. And some economists say that we're teetering on a recession. That can cause a lot of uncertainty for people who are getting ready to retire. We're going to take a quick break, but when I come back, I'm sitting down with a financial advisor to talk about how you can best prepare. Well, today marks one year since the Taliban took control of Afghanistan. The U.S. military was in the process of withdrawing from the country after occupying it for 20 years. And this is video out of Kabul today. Taliban supporters celebrated and chanted outside the former U.S. embassy. Since the Taliban took control of Afghanistan, more than 100,000 people fled the country. And broken down, about 76,000 Afghan refugees have reached the United States. According to the New York Times, that's the largest number of wartime evacuees since the fall of Saigon in Vietnam. Locally, Sacramento has welcomed one of the largest populations of Afghan refugees since the Taliban takeover. The region has welcomed more than 2,000 people. Well, a new study from UCLA shows that climate change is increasing the likelihood of a mega flood hitting in the next 50 years. Yeah, you heard that right. These are renderings of what Sacramento, Fresno, and Los Angeles could look like in the years to come. The flood could turn California's lowlands into an inland sea, and simply put, these cities could really be underwater. Researchers say that this so-called mega flood hitting California could have doubled, and this wouldn't be the first time this has happened in Sacramento. The great floods of 1850 and 1862 left Sacramento completely underwater, leaving cities and its levees just destroyed. So let's really hope that history does not repeat itself. But we want to get things over to Monica because the more imminent threat right now is this heat. We've seen that triple digits all day, Monica. Yes, we have certainly. As far as our Gilmore backyard right now, still very warm as we're heading into this late Monday evening or afternoon and early evening, I should say. Our temperature is still around 100 degrees. We've got light winds, sunny skies, 81 for Tahoe right now with sunshine, but we're looking for the chance of thunderstorms for this year starting tomorrow and taking us through Thursday. Our heat advisory starts up tomorrow. That's going to take us through Friday. The impacts being maximum highs near 109 closer to Redding locally a little closer to around 106 valley lows in the 60s and 70s and our foothill lows we're only dropping into the 70s and 80s. First spare the air day alert for the season is called for tomorrow. Uh, ways to help our air quality is to reduce our driving with carpooling to work or school, reduce equipment use like lawn and garden equipment that uses gas and uh, use active transit like bicycling or walking or even using a scooter as well. Hour by hour temperatures as we take you through the rest of tonight will drop down into the mid 60s. A quick warm up for tomorrow afternoon with extreme heat on the way tonight, by the way, last eight o'clock sunset for the year. After this, we're before eight o'clock. Kind of takes the edge off of that heat a little bit. As far as our 10 day forecast, we continue with those triple digits through Friday. 90s, though, by the weekend, Alex. If it's not inflation, it's the stock market. Something about the economy is keeping us up at night, and there are very real fears about the possibility of a recession. So, what does this mean for people looking to retire? Because we can't predict the future, but we sure as heck can prepare for it. I'm here with Shane Korea, financial advisor. Shane, thank you so much for being here. Um, the first question I want to ask you is, how can people really prepare? Like, what are your clients coming to you for? Like, what is keeping them up at night? Um, well, thanks for having me. I think the main thing about the recession is the unknown, the uncertainty of it, and whether or not they're going to have enough for retirement if the stock market remains so volatile. And I always say this is a long-term game. So we don't have a quick fix. We need to just sit and wait. And historically, we have seen us come out of recessions after a couple of years. So it's a waiting game. It's a long-term game. And people we just, just have need to, to be patient. patient. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so statistically, we know that women just outlive men. So right. what should women be thinking about when it comes to retirement? Because if that's the case, how will you have enough money to live on and you not outlive your retirement? Right. That's a huge fear is what if I outlive my retirement? Right. There are tools out there. So it's planning, 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 right? Sitting down with somebody and really um, putting together a financial plan. We always have to be looking at, or if you think about it like a car, 
pop the hood, make sure that you're refilling your oil, you're putting water in, you're making sure that everything's connected and talking to each other. So you do that with your plan. Um, and then you look at things like annuities that can help you so that you don't outlive your income. So really the tool is planning, talking to somebody and getting it all uh, planned out. Preparing. <laughs> Preparing, exactly. And then uh, something that a lot of people may not think about is taxes. What role do taxes play in planning for retirement? Is that something that people should really be keeping their eye on? Yeah, huge role. Um, we always say, oh, well, I'm gonna defer my taxes. We've been told, put money in your 401k, your IRA, you can defer your taxes. That's awesome. But when you're getting ready to reach retirement and you're in retirement, now taxes is a huge <laughs> bomb that's about to go off, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so between the ages of 59 and 72, that's when you should really be planning for retirement or taking those withdrawals out so that you can do things like converting them into a Roth, paying taxes little by little every year instead of at age 72 when it's required. That's when the IRS says, hey, it's time to pay me. And if people don't know where to start, I mean, they should start with a financial advisor, right? Absolutely. Like you said, pop the hood, see what's yep. under there, yep. and get a check. A comprehensive planner that has uh, an investment license, that has insurance licenses, right, that does full-fledged planning with estate planning. You want somebody like that that's going to be able to take you from budgeting, right, your relationship with money, the money mindset, and all of the right vehicles that you can be putting your money in so that you can mit mitigate taxes at the outset or at the end game. Yeah, all right, Shane, yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Absolutely. And if you do want more information, all you have to do is just email our team at to the point at abc10.com. We will also have a list of resources on our homepage where you can check out everything that you need to know. Airplane seats, they're small, but now the federal government might be changing that. We'll get into more after the break. A big season two premiere is happening this week on To The Point. Last year, ABC 10 investigative reporter Andy Judson uncovered the systemic issues with California's conservatorships industry that allow the abuse of the most vulnerable. Now she's bringing to light similar flaws with limited conservatorships for people with disabilities, a multi-billion dollar state agency created with taxpayer money that has separated families like the Schuette family who has not been able to care for their son in years. Conservatorships, brought to light by Britney Spears, but impact thousands every day. A photo was sent back to us, boxing gloves taped to his arms, and a newspaper saying this is the date. It's almost like he was held hostage. Taking some with disabilities from their families. Where's my son? Is he alive? If I could have predicted this, we would have left the state of California. Our two-year investigation found a deeply broken system. We, we do object to the media being in these proceedings. Hurting the very people it's promised to protect. This is shameful. It's shocking. This is the price of care taken by the state. Join us for a special edition of To The Point this Thursday at 6 p.m. to watch the price of care taken by the state. It's a five-part investigative series that seeks to hold those in power accountable. But before we go, let's talk about airplane seats for just a minute because they are annoyingly small. And it turns out the FAA might have some concerns about their safety. And now you've got a chance to sound off. That's because Congress is ordering the FAA to study seat sizes and get public opinion. Now they asked for this five years ago. Obviously that didn't happen, but I mean, hey, better late than never, right? They're looking for people just like me and you to read through 68 pages of this, what you're seeing on your screen right now. It's detailing how long it takes to evacuate a plane. So if you've got time to review a few things like anthropometric chair measurements, I'm sure the FAA would be thrilled to hear your comments. And if you really are interested, we do have the information on our website, abc10.com slash links, and who knows, Maybe you can make flights safer and inadvertently get us some bigger chairs in the process. Not a bad thing. All right. Thank you so much for spending your Monday evening with us. I am no stranger to California, but I am new to Sacramento. I want to hear what's going on in your world, and there are a million ways to reach me. I've got Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or you can just simply email me at to the point at abc10.com. We'd really love to hear from you. Have a great Monday.